Welcome all of you to worship. It's good to be with all of you today. We have an important day in the life of our congregation with our annual meeting right after this worship service. So I've taken my usual three-hour sermon and tried to chop it down to maybe about two and a half hours, see if we can get out of here on time today. That's actually funnier than, than the laughter in the room would tell me. There, that's better. Okay. So um, it's an important time together. As you guys know, we've made some communications uh, this week about some of the adjustments we've had to make on our church's budget, some strategic decisions about that. You're going to hear more about that at the annual meeting, so I would invite you to come and to participate with us as we go over uh, to the Upper Fine Center, as Pastor Camille shared with you earlier. I want to have you take a look at a statue with me very quickly, and this is a statue of Justicia, and uh, this particular statue of Justicia is taken from the Old Bailey, which is the court building in London, if you will, for lack of a better word, the equivalent of their Supreme Court. And uh, Justicia, in this particular uh, depiction, you'll notice uh, holding the scales of uh, justice and an upright sword, in other words, to, to frame the uh, enforcement of that justice. And then it's hard to tell in this picture, I should have zoomed in a little tighter for you, uh, but maybe you can tell, is Justicia wearing a blindfold in this depiction? The correct answer is no, Justicia is not wearing a blindfold. Now, when we depict Justicia, also called Lady Justice, in the United States and in modern depictions, Justicia looks more like this. And that is with the sword, instead of being raised, the sword is lowered, the scales are in front, and Justicia is blindfolded. Did you know that the name of Lady Justice is Justicia? Justicia is a Roman pagan god that was uh, really erected in the form we know it today by Emperor Augustus. Did I mention Roman pagan god? Did, I, did that come out somewhere along the way? And so this symbol we use to e uh, epitomize justice for us, at least with mostly in Western culture, is drawn out of the form of Roman paganism. The blindfold was added later to somehow imply that Lady Justice or Justicia is uh, impartial. And today I want to focus with you on that very topic of being impartial and partiality when it comes to justice and justice making. We're continuing in a series of messages today called Value the Difference, where we're exploring some of the key values we hold as Christian believers and how we hold those values in a peculiar and a distinct sort of way that makes us the salt of the earth or a light to the world, that the way in which we practice justice as followers of Jesus is possibly different than how it is typically practiced within, well, let's just say the Western world. I'm very thankful for uh, Serena to come on up. Serena Pook is going to read the scripture today for us. And this passage that she's going to read may start out sounding familiar to you. I'll talk to you about it in a minute. But this passage is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10. So let's listen carefully. Hello. Um, Deuteronomy, chapter 10, verses 12 through 22, page 231 in the Pew Bibles. Now, in the light of all that Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? Only this, revere the Lord your God by walking in his ways, by loving him, by serving the Lord your God um, <laughs> with all your heart and being, and by keeping the Lord's commands and regulations I'm, that I'm commanding you right now. It's for your own good. Clearly, the Lord owns the sky, in the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it. But the Lord adored your ancestors, loving them and choosing the descendants that followed them, you, from all other people. That's how the things still stand. So circumcise your hearts and stop being so stubborn, because the Lord your God is the God of all gods and the Lord of all lords. The great, mighty, and awesome God who doesn't play favorites and doesn't take bribes. He enacts justice for orphans and widows 
and he loves immigrants, giving them food and clothing. That means you must also love immigrants because you were immigrants in Egypt. Revere the Lord your God, serve him, cling to him, swear by his name alone. He is your praise. He is your God, the one who performed these great awesome acts that you witnessed with your very own eyes. Your ancestors went down to Egypt with a total of 70 people. But now look, the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the nighttime sky. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Serena. Appreciate you reading that text for us. It, it starts out in that text in verse 10, what does the Lord require of you? And usually when we hear that, for those of you who read the Bible here and there, that will remind you of another passage of Scripture in the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. What does the Lord require of you? As it is on the screen. And it is to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. You've perhaps heard this passage of Scripture before. Uh, I want you to hold on to that because the next week's sermon is based on that text. This week, we want to focus on the text from which that one in Micah is based. And that's this text that you just heard read from Deuteronomy 10. In the case of Deuteronomy 10, it tells us that what does God require of us? Well, it's to fear the Lord, to walk in all his ways, to love him and serve him with all one's heart and to keep the Lord's statutes. In both of these passages of scripture, Deuteronomy 10 and Micah chapter 6, this notion of love and justice being knit together is there. It's unavoidable, to the point that I would suggest that justice is love, that justice is love. Now, typically, when we think about our civil form of justice, the word love probably doesn't come to mind. We'll talk about that a little bit more later, but for right now, just hold on to this notion that justice is love and how important it is for us to think about that. Now, this relationship between the love of God and love of neighbor and the work of justice is, is deeply grounded in our tradition. And it's unavoidable for us, especially even those of us who call ourselves Methodist people. Our founder, B.T. Roberts of the Free Methodist Movement, was an abolitionist who fiercely opposed the practice of slavery. And so his desire and love for God fueled the call for justice that he brought forth in the early days of the Free Methodist Movement. There are a variety of people, as I shared last week, in the Free Methodist Movement in those early days that were part of the Underground Railroad, helping to move slaves from the southern states to the north so that they might find their freedom. We could go on and talk about other great Methodists, like uh, just a couple of decades later, the great Francis Willard, who led so many great movements within the Methodist life and within our tradition, and that she is largely responsible for igniting a movement that led to women's suffrage in the 20th century, although she did not live to see it. But she was key in being a part of the early movements of the social justice a movement back in the 1880s and 1890s, opening orphanages, taking care of families, feeding people who were hungry, ensuring that people who were untended for were tended for. Probably Francis Willard's great contribution to American society is uh, helping to drive the movement to establish prohibition. So you can thank Francis Willard in part for that. Francis Willard was a fantastic leader, a brilliant woman of faith who integrated so well her life. You can read a book written, uh, published by a friend of mine at Boston University, Chris Evans, just wrote a biography on Francis Willard. You can read a lot more about her life. It's a remarkable, remarkable story about how she integrated her faith and love of God in this work around justice. Of course, today on Martin Luther King Jr. weekend with the holiday tomorrow in which we remember Dr. King, we can scarcely omit Dr. King's contribution to the work of justice around American life and around the world. And we have to acknowledge the deep integration of faith and theology in Dr. King's legacy and how those two things are interwoven so deeply in his calls for justice in American life. Now, Dr. King was Baptist, so in the Hall of Fame of Methodist, he's not necessarily in that Hall of Fame. That's all right. He did go to a Methodist school, the Boston University School of Theology, where he got his doctorate, so we'll leave that for another day. 
But there's one person I wanted to focus on in particular this morning, and he's one of my heroes. And when you leave my office here in the church and every office I've been in for the number of years I've, uh, I've had this particular picture, I have a, a picture of him right above my door. So every time when I leave my office, I'm reminded of what a great Methodist does. And his name is Jackie Robinson. And I want to talk with you a little bit about Jackie Robinson and the legacy that he left in this movement of justice and how it combined with his faithfulness and the love he had for God. Well over a decade before Rosa Parks was thrown off of a bus because she refused to sit in the back of it, Jackie Robinson had the same thing happen to him on July 6, 1944, when he was in the army at Fort Hood, Texas. He boarded a bus with the other uh, troops in his grouping, and he sat at the front of the bus, and the driver told them that he had to go sit at the back of the bus, and he refused to the point that the MPs had to get on the bus and drag him off of it. Jackie Robinson was almost court-martialed for that, but luckily dodged that accusation and continued in the army until he was eventually discharged. He went on to go to UCLA and get his degree and, as you know, play baseball. But a few other things you should know about Jackie Robinson. His grandfather was a slave. His father was a sharecropper. His brother, Mac, won the silver medal in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, one of the only two black men to win a medal in those Olympic Games under Hitler's leadership. And you know the other one, Jesse Owens. There's a great tradition with Jackie Robinson that's an important one in that as he graduated UCLA and was playing baseball, he eventually came to play in the Negro Leagues and found his way to a team called the Kansas City Monarchs. And it was there playing for the Monarchs, he caught the eye of a particular general manager for the Brooklyn Dodgers who was looking to bring a black man into an all-white sport called Major League Baseball. The picture I have in my office of Jackie Robinson that hangs on the wall is the cover of Time magazine from November of 1947. And in that picture, you'll see a sea of white baseballs laying around and Jackie Robinson's head sticking right out of the middle of them. So artistically done. When Jackie was brought into Major League Baseball, he was recruited by a man named Branch Rickey, who was the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, himself a graduate of Ohio Wesleyan University, a lifelong Methodist who believed that it was important for him as a man of faith and as a leader in baseball and, to be honest, what was good for the sport of baseball financially to find a way to bring someone from the Negro Leagues into Major League Baseball. And so he scoured around looking for the very best talent, and he happened to find the very best player in the Negro Leagues, in his opinion, and that was Jackie Robinson. But there was one other reason why Branch Rickey liked Jackie Robinson. So I thought I'd show you the clip from the movie 42, where this conversation takes place or is depicted. He's the troublemaker. Oh, he argues with umpires. A quick temper is his reputation. Well, what was he court-martialed for? Wouldn't sit in the back of a military bus. Fort Hood, Texas. Driver asked him to move back. <laughs> MPs had to take him off. Well, yeah, you see? I see he resents segregation. If you were white, you'd call that spirit. Robinson's a Methodist. I'm a Methodist. God's a Methodist. You can't go wrong. Find him. Bring him here. Jackie Robinson is indebted in his life to the pastor of the Scott Memorial Methodist Church in Pasadena, California. It was that pastor, while Jackie was at UCLA, who led him to faith in Jesus Christ. That's how Jackie Robinson became a Methodist. But more importantly, how he became a Christian and a lover of God who sought to bring the justice of God into the world. Branch Rickey, Methodist. Jackie Robinson, Methodist. Do you pick something up here? B.T. Roberts, Methodist. Francis Willard, Methodist. These movements that we've seen within American life and culture are born out of people who are deeply convinced that God's justice in the world is an expression of God's love and that they go together. Jackie Robinson's epitaph, it says on his gravestone, is this. A life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. Fitting, fitting for a champion of justice. 
So some questions I'd like you to wonder about this week. How has justice been more than a cause to you? And what makes justice real in the world? And then where is there a need for justice in your life today, at least defined this way? And what steps can you take this week to manifest it? So we've talked about justice in somewhat generic terms. I want to talk about it a little bit more specifically in light of this text because there's a nuance in Deuteronomy 10 that's going to help us understand better what what justice looks like in the biblical framework. It says in Deuteronomy 10, 17, this. For the Lord your God is is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who does not show partiality, nor take a bribe. I want you to focus on the last part there, who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. So it sounds like the depiction of justicia blindfolded is compatible with the justice that God brings. However, they are a bit different. They are a bit different. Because this God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe, this same God shows deference and prejudicial favoritism to orphans, to widows, and the sojourner or the immigrant in the land, it says in that very same text in Deuteronomy 10. So how can God have no partiality, but yet show favoritism with those groups of people? That doesn't sound quite right, and it has everything to do with the grammar at the end of that particular passage of Scripture in verse 17. That God does not show partiality, nor take a bribe. It's the bribe part that you need to grab a hold of. That God is not swayed by power. God is not swayed by influence. There's no way to buy God off. There's no way to persuade God to do something out of God's character. What the text is trying to tell us is that God shows no partiality from the standpoint that God cannot be manipulated to achieve one's outcomes. It's important for us to sit with that for a minute because there is a difference between equal, equality, and equity. These three words mean different things. So let's talk about them just for a moment. Equal is when everybody is the same and has the same opportunity or capacity. So If you're an orphan, a widow, or an immigrant, well, that was some bad decision-making on your part. That's equal. That everyone is given equal capacity, and some people know how to use it, and some people don't know how to use it. Then there's equality, and that's a little different. Equality is when we distribute resources equally to all people so that everyone gets the same assistance. So, Equality is like uh, everybody has boots and everybody has straps on those boots, so everyone should pull themselves up by their bootstraps. So what happens if you don't have any boots or you don't have any boots with straps? Equality is giving the same form or the same amount of assistance or support and somehow expecting a great outcome. Equality is different. Equality is when we envision Everyone reaching the same goal, but everybody starting from a different place. So in order to get to the same goal, some people are going to need more help. Some people are going to need less help. Well, let's talk about it in terms of what the text is telling us. Orphans, widows, and the immigrant or the sojourner, the stranger in the land. Children in the ancient world, not today, but in the ancient world and in agrarian society, were considered a drain on the family's resources because a child wasn't old enough to work in the family trade or the farm. So the goal of raising children was to raise them as quickly as you could so they could do work, so they could, have, they could support the family in some form or another. So before that, they were considered a drain on the resources, especially an orphan, because now it's not even your own child that you're called to support and somehow encourage. What do we make of Jesus who welcomes the children? Twice in Luke, twice in Mark, three times in the Gospel of Matthew. 
What are we to make of this Jesus that gathers children around and then has the audacity to look his disciples right in the face and say, you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you're like one of these. You see, Jesus turns this whole thing on end. Jesus, in a sense, is saying exactly what Deuteronomy 10 is telling us, that there is to be care for the orphan, care for the child, care for the young among you. What about widows, for example? Widows in a, in a patriarchal world, even more patriarchal than the world we live in today, for example, women in a patriarchal world without a husband because they're widowed, without a father, without a brother, or without their husband's brother or their husband's brother brother, that's a famous story of Jesus we could go on about, without male covering, women were destitute. So to be a widow is to have nothing. It's to really be abandoned. But yet Jesus tells us a story about a widow who brought two small coins into an offering and how her offering was vastly more valuable than any wealthy person brought that day. Does that sound equal to you? Does that sound like equality to you? No, but it might sound like equity to you. What of the stranger, the sojourner, the immigrant, a displaced and wandering person, no home, no context, no agency. What are we to make of that? That person, too, is a, a drain on resources in every way. Jesus told a great story about a guy that was out of place, out of sorts, in the wrong place at the wrong time, making a sojourn on his way somewhere, and yet he's the only person who rendered compassion. That's the parable of the Good Samaritan. Friends, when we read the Bible, not just in Deuteronomy 10, not just in Micah 6, but when we watch and read the stories of Jesus, what we find is a Jesus that practices a justice of equity, not equality, not equalness, equity. The goal is to bring everybody in, to pull everybody to the love of God, to bring and to summon people as an invitation to know the grace of a living God. The work we do as a congregation follows suit. We celebrate the work we do in, in ministries like Fostering Hope in our congregation, where we work with foster children, dominantly those who are older children in the foster care system. We do that work for exactly this reason. This is our work of justice, but it's fused to our love for God. It's not separated from it, it's in it. And so all of the work that we do with these foster children and their families in that system is designed to convey the love of God to them, to bring to them the capacities they need to move into a, a form of livelihood that frees them from oppression and exploitation. We could go on about the mission work we're going to be doing this year as a congregation and the short-term mission trip we're going to have later on this year where we're going to learn together from our brothers and sisters and other places in Latin America and how we might grow in our own faith as we serve one another in that space. We could talk about our need to reach emerging communities, people who floated into the city of Seattle because of a job and they have no other connection. In some ways, they're like the stranger among us. They're like the immigrant among us. We're to take care of those people, watch out for them, look out for them, reach out to them. This is our calling we convey the compassion and love of God to those who are at the margins, the least, the last, and the lost. This is our work as a church. It's important work for us to do. So a couple of questions for us to wonder about together again this week is how does the notion of equity challenge your personal views and opinions? And what about it is challenging? And then is there space to become more accommodating, patient, and compassionate? So I want to close by simply saying this. If you're going to make a mistake, which in, when it comes to the world of justice, we're going to make a mistake. The great theologian Martin, Martin Bieber said that all forms of human justice are imperfect. There's a way in which we know we're not going to get this right. That in our practice of justice that we're going to lean oftentimes too much toward the Roman pagan god, Justicia, instead of leaning more toward the compassion, loving, just reign and rule of God. So we're going to make mistakes. And what I can tell you, at least from my standpoint, 
is that those mistakes that we make in many ways define us. So I'd encourage us to make a good mistake. Make a mistake in keeping with the character that we see of God in the Scripture. The character we see of God embodied in Jesus Christ is that if you're going to make a mistake, is it better to be too accepting or too condemning? Which one? If you're going to make a mistake, which one are you going to make? More accepting. Because the condemning one, ah, that's, that's shifting sand. Even Jesus himself said, the Son of Man came not into the world to condemn it, but to what? Save it. It really plays off of these models we have in our head of God, our theology that we process. As you think about the justice of God, do you imagine God as a judge on a bench with a black robe? Or do you imagine a God who's wearing a doctor's coat, bringing healing and wholeness? Which metaphor comes to mind first when we think about the justice of God? When we look at the life of Jesus, we find very little of him donning the, donning the judge's robe, condemning and pointing the finger. What do we find in Jesus' life? Doctor's coat on, going around healing and forgiving and gracing. Yes, naming sin for what it is and that it breaks human life and breaks the relationship with God, but he brings healing into those places and wholeness into those places. If you're going to make a mistake, make a good one. Make a good one. I can tell you as a 54-year-old man, father of two, husband of one, that some of the greatest mistakes I've made in my life are the mistakes I've made when I thought I was acting justly. And oh, if I could reel those back in. I wish I could. I give thanks to God for this belongingness that we all have. Remember the sojourner or the alien in the land? The reason God tells the Israelites to welcome the stranger in their land is because God says, you were a stranger once too. And what we need to remember as a church, especially even as we get ready to go into a congregational meeting, is there's not one of us who's entitled to be here. Not one of us deserve to be here. Friends, you know this. I've shared with you already. I'm an adopted child. So even though I was adopted as a three-month-old infant, there's a part of me that knows what it's like to not belong and a part of me that knows what it's like to belong. And every single day of my life, I wake up giving thanks to God because I could just as easily not be here. Friends, if you're going to make a mistake, make one that's generous, make one that's compassionate, make one that's accepting, make one that's loving, make one that's in keeping with the way you see God leaning in the world. Remember, we're in sales, not management. We're not the gatekeepers. God is. Our job is to extend the love of God everywhere we go because it's not just about the love of God, friends. It's about the justice of God being extended into the world through us. A rule of equity that God brings. As we gather around this table, is this not the table of equity? That <laughs> Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection gives everything for us. Everything for the world, as we Wesleyans believe, to draw us in. This is justice. And I pray that our justice will never be blind. That it will always see where the deepest human need is and speak grace into that moment. Here's a question I have for you to think about as we end this time together. Is where in your life is there space for a good mistake about justice? Sometimes this becomes very personal. Have there been people in your life that you've written off? People that you think are just unworthy of your attention? Individuals that you think have no chance that can never change? 
Those are questions of justice too. So let's come to this meal Jesus has set for us and pray for the strength we need to be justice makers. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we give you thanks for this table that you set before us in such abundance. The love that you've displayed for us in your justice is overwhelming. We can't even describe it or name it. And so, God, we give thanks. Thanks that you call even people like us to gather around a table such as this. Thank you.